and thank you for coming out. I know there are lots of choices for what you could do um, on, on an evening such as this. It's so nice and cool, so thanks, thanks for coming down, and, and uh, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Dr. Taylor, for uh, the invitation to come speak. Um, uh, Derek and I have been talking for a long time because we, uh, you know, we've been friends for almost 10 years now, uh, and we went through our PhD programs essentially at the same time. And um, a problem that we've always been tackling is just these, the secular bias in everything that has to do with history. And so, uh, since my specialization is the colonial period, right, my degree is actually in literature, uh, but the, the genre that I focused on was historiography. So, in the colonial period, um, and the texts that I focused on heavily, as Derek said, are those that indigenous people wrote, indigenous people who were in processes of Christianization themselves. So what did they have to say about their experiences? And oftentimes, of course, the secular historians want to ignore or brush it aside or focus on other aspects that are of interest to them. So uh, what my approach is, I mean, I've, I've had a couple of people ask me, is there like a secular and religious version of this talk? And I'm gonna say, no, the answer is no. I just tell the truth. I just tell what has actually happened. And then uh, it's looking at it from a Catholic perspective, we see um, a larger plan in this, and we see, we see some, some goodness uh, as a secular historian uh, may not necessarily see or may overlook. So, um, a big difference, I can kind of make a quick difference between what Derek does and what I do, has to do with the number of texts that a person reads. Uh, a historian in general will look at many primary texts. Like I, I talked with an historian who wrote an article about Woodrow Wilson. He said he read uh, 200 newspaper articles and, and then he could say something about Woodrow Wilson's speech. Well, in literature we do something that's related, but it's a little different. You focus really closely on one or two texts, right, when you're doing an article. So I have looked uh, deeply into um, indigenous writings, look at, looking at them closely, but in order to understand them well, I've had to read lots of other history to help uh, situate it. So in any case, uh, let's begin here. Black legends, myths of the Spanish conquest. So I'm gonna start off with, why does all this matter, right? Here are my central ideas, making them as plain as possible. I mean, why does it matter? If you live in the Americas, much of the territory in this hemisphere was Spain's. The Spanish Empire has influenced U.S. history in profound ways. Just a very simple example, of something that, that we often overlook, is uh, the dollar sign, right? We're all familiar, of course, the vertical bar and the S, right? What that is, is actually a smaller part of a larger motif. It was the royal crest of Philip II. So if you can imagine the shield in the middle with the other symbols, and on either side there were two pillars. And then laced around these pillars were banners with his um, Latin slogan. So all that came to be associated with money because for 300 years, Spain controlled most of the silver production in the world. So uh, when the dollar came along and when, when, uh, when the British uh, gained ascendancy in the 19th century, they just kept that symbol. So every time you spend a dollar, you are recalling that, um, that economic basis that was Spanish. It's the economic basis of the dollar. The dollar comes from the Spanish doubloon. Looking a little closer at the doubloon, everyone knows what a doubloon is, right? We always talk about the pirates and things like that. And of course, we all know uh, the uh, expression, shaving a haircut, two bits, right? Bit, 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 bit. Well, how many bits are in a dollar? Eight. Eight, exactly. Because in order to make change, there was nothing smaller than a doubloon, so they would cut it into eight slices in order to make change. And that custom and, and those expressions carried over into the dollar. So that, that, that right away is a trace of what, why does all this matter? We are standing on uh, for, uh, the former Spanish uh, empire in lots of ways, as we'll see in a few minutes. So I want to take a look at um, the stereotypes that have, have started growing in English-speaking countries beginning in the 19th century. 
and showed that uh, they have uh, made a sort of lens for looking at the Spanish past of the Americas. I want to show that contrary to these representations, Spanish power was not total. That's the place to begin. Spanish power was not total. And uh, two larger points flow from this, right? First is that those later um, Anglo-centric narratives, meaning what British people, British Protestants, said about Spanish Catholics, right, uh, interfere with our understanding of history and makes um, the Spaniards look uh, innately violent. And that was intentional. They were trying to portray the Spanish as innately violent, as innately more violent than other peoples. And uh, then the second implication is that uh, with that lens gone, we can look at the indigenous past of the Americas now, which the Spanish could not touch, right? And for, uh, for the faith, that means we have different kind of cultural expressions of Catholicism, which are unique, uh, but at the same time, uh, of course, very sincere and uh, are in line with the church. So um, moving on then, Uh, so we'll talk just a little bit about the stereotypes. I, I think one that comes to mind recently, a sort of summary of all these stereotypes, is the film Apocalypto that um, Mel Gibson released a few years ago. Has anyone seen Apocalypto? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Now, um, what sort of indigenous society is in that film? Right? Is it all kind of egalitarian, everyone's getting along? No, what's, what's it like? The whole it, it, yeah. priesthood is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it doesn't shy away from the fact that the Aztecs were brutalizing the locals. Yes. The yeah. Human sacrifice and sacrificing mm -hmm. them and killing them in whatever they wanted, whatever they, way they wanted to. Yeah, the defeated ones were used for the sacrifice. Exactly. Yeah, so it, it, it represents uh, the violent aspects very vividly, right? Uh, but the, the problem with, with the representations of the colonial past is that we have, yes, the violent representations of the natives, which wasn't entirely true because not all groups were that way. Uh, and then you have a scene in Apocalypto towards the end. Yeah. Um, they're chasing this innocent prisoner through the jungle. This prisoner escapes and he, and he ends up escaping human sacrifice. And they're chasing him through the jungle. And they come out onto a beach. And off in the distance, you see the three masts of these Spanish galleons, right? Well, the three uh, indigenous warriors, the three native warriors are running on the beach, and all of a sudden, they, they halt dead in their tracks. And all of them are totally terrified. The prisoner turns around, and he's even more scared, and he runs back towards the jungle. So in that representation, we have these, these two negatives. The, the, the indigenous people are inherently violent, right? And so are the Spanish, right? So there's fear on both sides. And that is a lens that we have when, uh, when we tend to approach um, the, uh, the colonial period. Now, the good news is that serious scholars of the period uh, don't, don't take that seriously. Uh, Atelier Ruiz Medrano, for example, she's at uh, the National University of Mexico, and um, Susan Kellogg, who's at Tulane, they advance the thesis that rather than oppression, the Native Americans experienced a complex reality. They, they had agency, they had choices. They had their own economic resources and knowledge of the terrain in the homeland that the Spaniards didn't have. And because of that, they ended up negotiating a lot of times their relationship with the Spanish. It was negotiation within domination. Now we have a lot of examples they bring into this book just to kind of summarize, give a little peek without getting too bogged down, but there are thousands of court cases where indigenous people will sue the Spanish government in order to get lands, or in order to get payments, or in order to uh, denounce the abuses of a soldier, or abuses of clergy, and they win. And not only do they win from their oral testimony, but they win when they bring in their pictorial codices that had, the, say, a, a picture of a family tree on it. They said, well, we are related to this lord. That means that the land is actually ours. And, then, and, the, and the Spanish judge smacks down his gavel and he says, you win. That means the Spaniards have to get off your land. We have 
hundreds of, of court cases that, that show this. So right, right there, there's a hint of like how the Spanish weren't actually oppressing and controlling like, uh, like we might usually think of. So uh, another example here, which I'll pass around, use some PowerPoint, but I want people to be able to, to feel things for themselves. I'm going to talk about a book, I might as well bring it if I can. So uh, it's Matthew Restall's Seven Myths of the Spanish Conquest. While this book helped inspire the talk, the, the legends that I'm looking at draw from several other sources and, and my own study things, things that I've seen. But in his book, he uh, examines similar stereotypes that come from the English-speaking view history. So he, uh, he looks closely at Columbus and uh, Hernán Cortés and Francisco Pizarro and lots of other figures that um, over time have been built up into something bigger and more violent than they actually were. Uh, now another problem that attends our view of the colonial past is, is a general problem that exists in the West when we're looking at history. Ever since the Enlightenment, uh, we've, attend, we've uh, tended to accept a, a progress narrative of history, which is to say that we look at, at the past as a series of ages of ignorance and violence, which have forced humanity to pass through trials and then to come up with innovations. And eventually, humans have emerged from a backward and naive existence and made strides towards a more a civilized or advanced future. In other words, if we have history as a line, the past is negative, ignorant, violent. The future is positive, optimistic, civilized, right? Uh, the problem with this, the first one, is that the future hasn't happened yet. So you basically have to have faith that it's going to be better. We're actually unmasking a little bit of the secularist world. It's actually a faith claim that the future will be better because of technology or because it's simply the future, because we're modern, right? You have to accept it without any evidence. Okay. Uh, the philosopher Charles Taylor, who, uh, a practicing Catholic who teaches at McGill University in Canada, has called these descriptions of history subtraction stories. So uh, for me, as a literary scholar, the whole idea of storytelling as history appeals to me, right? Uh, history telling. Uh, helps explain why people tend to look at one or two situations in the past and then build a whole grand narrative around them, um, holding all the way that people's lives are somehow less meaningful in the backward and violent past <coughs> than they are now. Uh, Taylor's ideas of subtraction stories argue that, that we tend to retell the past as only oppressive, even though evidence exists that certain freedoms were stronger in the past than they are now. Uh, two examples, one that's really concrete, is when Christendom is one entity, right? There are no nation states. So in order to go from one part of Christendom to another, you don't need to show a passport, right? Which means that there was a lot of freedom of movement in the past that doesn't exist now. Another example of how uh, people who we consider to be very free now, uh, people who, who perhaps are well off financially, right? Or or the nobles, right, the noble people, in the past, they actually tended to have less freedom in regards to marriage, because uh, the farther back you go, you have to try to uh, marry within the social class or with another noble in order to hold on to your wealth, right? Whereas poor people tended to have the freedom to marry for love, at least the opportunity to do so. So, um, subtraction stories on kind of a, deeper level, reinforce uh, a more uh, negative idea, or a nefarious idea, that our lives in the present are superior to those of people in the past, right? And this, of course, ignores positive contributions of marginalized everyday people in the past. And I could add, even just with the eyes of faith, think of all the um, invisible saints, right? The, the, the saints only God knows of, and uh, living out their simple lives but it's, it's the everyday people who really make the bulk of history. So, uh, diving in then to the first legend. 
which I've been skirting around by calling it total control, but here it is. The legend of total conquest runs something like this. There were these peaceful indigenous societies and everyone was living in these, in these kind of utopic or idyllic existences, and then all of a sudden the Spaniards came. And they strode into town with their horses and their guns and their metal and their uh, gold thirsty ways and they bulldozed over everyone and no one had a chance to uh, resist and everyone just accepted it, right? Well, once we start looking a little closer, we see that no, it's not, not the case at all. Popular ideas about the Spanish Empire depict their power as absolute, but a closer look shows that that kind of control was not possible in the 16th century. In fact, it was not possible to absolutely control territories until the 19th and 20th century, right? What do you need to exert absolute control? You need a very large standing army, and you also need instantaneous communication to know what's happening in a very far region from where you are, and then send the army out to control it, or send a message saying, arrest this person and take them to jail. We can't do that until the telegraph exists. Uh, so it's not until really Napoleon, although he didn't have the telegraph, he had similar means of communication that were rapid enough to affect that. It wasn't until Napoleon where we have that kind of oppression, where just instantaneously the government tells you what to do or else, right? And that's also happening at the same time as the rise of secularism, right? Which is a, a, a related topic, but something that I can't get into very much, right? Uh, okay, so let's take a look though a little bit at the, at the Spanish technology. We usually think of the Spanish technology as, as superior, right? Uh, didn't they have cannons? Didn't they have guns? Uh, well, yeah, they did. They had, gun, they had rifles of a sort called harquebuses, but in truth their firearms were limited they aimed poorly and took several minutes to load. The overall effect of the guns was more to surprise and intimidate than to actually kill. Another problem that the Spanish had was the numerical superiority of the indigenous people. Uh, for example, the first time that Cortez's men tried to conquer Tenochtitlan, he only had a few hundred Spaniards against an army of several thousand, you know, maybe 10,000. Uh, so the first time they tried that, they tried to attack um, directly, the, the warriors ran them out of the city and killed several of them. And Cortez and, and his company called the event La Noche Triste, the evening of sorrow, right? The night of sorrow. Uh, Cortez was not able to conquer the Aztecs until he made an alliance with a native group who was the enemy of the empire, the Tlaxcaltecos the Tlaxcaltecos, as they would say, right? So when it comes to the Spanish Empire, we're not talking about a totalitarian government interested in controlling every aspect of people's lives. Rather, we're talking about a government that modeled itself after the Roman Empire. And the Romans were mostly concerned with extracting tribute and other resources from their territories. As long as the people were paying tribute, there was no need for force. And the, the tribute collection in and of, in and of itself is limited because it can only be in person and it can only occur in cities, which is where the soldiers were. So um, one effect of this or evidence that we have for this, it comes from the tribute records themselves. They kept meticulous records of the, of the tribute that they collected, but natural events could affect how well they were able to uh, collect the tribute, for example, during the 1600s in Mexico City, there was a series of floods that caused many people to abandon the city. And when they left the city, they took their tribute revenue with them. Spain was making less and less money the more and more it rained. There was nothing that the Spanish could do about it either. They simply lacked the resources to go into the countryside and seek out everyone who was dodging their tribute payments. In fact, the only entity that kept detailed records on the comings and goings of people, right, was the Catholic Church, via baptism, marriage, and death records. However, most of the time, the church was only partially invested in collecting tribute because they received a portion 
but they were by and large not interested in making Spanish monarchs or soldiers rich. This is what I love about looking a little closely into history, because you see this effect, whether you're a secular <coughs> historian or whether you're a Catholic historian, you, you see that the church is interested in maintaining churches, they're not interested in making Spanish soldiers rich, it's pretty plain to see. Okay, now here's a great illustration that I, I love to look at that actually opens up a window and a little bit more accurate description of the way power dynamics were uh, during the 16th century in New Spain. This image comes from a document called El Lienzo de Tlaxcala. You remember that Tlaxcaltecos, uh, Tlaxcaltecos were the enemies of the Aztecs and the ones that uh, Cortes had made an alliance with in order to conquer them, right? They produced this manuscript and they were part of a campaign called the Mixtone Wars, which was in the northern part of Mexico, going against large groups of indigenous people, which they called the Chichimecas, collectively. Now, um, let's take a look here. We have some in indigenous conventions in the drawing, which I can explain pretty quickly, and they're pretty straightforward, right? The larger the figure, the more important, right? So we see, of course, the first one in the foreground is the Spaniard with his horse, right? But then behind them, we see um, humans that are of equal size, the Tlaxcaltecan the warriors, right? They happen to be as large as Spaniards, right? They, they certainly look a lot more intimidating. You have the eagle flying above them, which signals the royalty. You have the complex designs on the shield, which offsets them from the, uh, the Chichimecas, who they represent as not noble because they don't have insignias on their shield and smaller and all these you know sort of things that, that goes along with that right uh the Tlaxcaltecans are paid mercenary soldiers the pro-spanish native warriors are larger fiercer and better equipped than the indigenous warriors that they confront also notice that the spanish soldier in the foreground he's not using a firearm that would be a waste of time. Instead, he's using a lance in battle. Is this Spanish soldier interested in killing all indigenous people? Clearly, we see that this is not the case. We see the indigenous allies of the Spanish who are fighting other indigenous people. What we have then is a complex colonial society in which it is possible for indigenous people to advance as long as they're willing to adapt to the culture of the Spaniards. But even if they aren't willing to adapt, a lot of people left the cities and moved into the remote countryside where they maintained their customs and beliefs over the centuries. And in a few minutes, we'll see a list of groups who have uh, really never converted because they've been so isolated and away from the Spanish influence. Spanish influence was mostly in cities and they simply lacked the, the, man, the manpower, or the capacity to go out into the countryside and try to impose their will. Okay, I have a couple of other examples of, uh, of regions that Spain never really controlled or controlled only uh, loosely. One is the, the Mayan zone. Uh, the, the first three times that they tried to land on the beaches and, and attack directly, the, the natives came down, the, the Mayan people, and chased them out and killed them and it was always bloody and, and the Spaniards always came out losing. They said, you know what? We need some help before we come here. The only uh, time they were able to really set up their colonial governments was after they got the help of mercenary soldiers from central Mexico, and they attacked on land from the west. Uh, so that is a, a clear example of how their, their conquest was not total. And another comes from the southern cone, the Mapuche people, who were effectively never conquered because they, they would leave the Spaniards up into um, little gorges and canyons and then ambush them. And once again, the Spaniards are like, this is, this is too costly. We're giving up all our soldiers. We're giving up all our horses. We just need to kind of give the Mapuche their space and focus on the northern regions where we can, where we can uh, farm and do uh, uh, ranching, right? And then also do the trade with the silver mines in the Andes. So they left the southern cone essentially uh, alone it wasn't until the Chilean government comes in. The secular government in the 19th century, the, the secular government goes and takes their guns and by force tells the indigenous people, you are now Chileans, 
and you will speak Spanish and you will pay taxes. And then at that point, even um, it was difficult for them to, to get consent from, uh, from the Mapuche. So of course, just further evidence that, that just in a logistical sense, the Spaniards weren't able to control, right? And bring that in like a tie into Catholicism, you know, because um, the whole purpose, really, the whole reason why the Spanish government got permission from Pope Alexander VI at the end of the 15th century, the whole reason for the exploration was the evangelization, right? So it's proof that even in spite of hypocrisy and in spite of abuses, the official purpose that they were there was to extend Christendom. And they considered themselves a kingdom that was part of Christendom, right? Uh, so if we can put ourselves more in that medieval and Christendom mindset, we can understand more what the Spanish were doing uh, miraculously. Okay. So uh, here's another example. It's a little closer to home of Spain's inability to fully conquer and control the territory. This example comes uh, from um, La Florida, right? This 1584 Spanish map of North America calls the whole region of the southeastern United States Florida. La Florida, right? That's right, for the Spaniards, all this area was Florida. And as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, Florida included the Ozarks, which as we know, brings us up pretty close to Pittsburgh, Kansas. So, from a Spanish point of view, we're all closer to Florida than, than we might think. <laughs> in 1597, uh, this, the Spaniards were controlling all of this vast territory, or trying to, from their port uh, and, their, and their garrison here of St. Augustine. So they were trying to administer effectively half of the United States from St. Augustine on foot and horseback with no rapid um, communication. So it, it, the idea of imposition is, is uh, not very logical there. It becomes like a, you know, ridiculous. Uh, so, what happened in 1597 was the uprising of the Guale natives who took the lives of several Spanish priests who were now uh, martyrs and, uh, and canonized. The natives burned down churches and tortured the clergymen before killing them. They also incited several other rebellions, which made the countryside very difficult for the Spaniards to control. As a matter of fact, that rebellion forced the Spanish to huddle even uh, more so in, into their uh, largest settlement St. Augustine. And at the end of this presentation, I'll go into more detail on, on the trip that we're planning with St. Augustine, where we can all learn firsthand how closely intertwined Spanish history is with the larger history of North America, and just how Catholic that history is. But anyway, going back just a little bit here, about 30 seconds here, I mentioned that it caused other rebellions in the countryside. Well, in what is now Georgia, there was a Camino Real of missions. So before there was the Camino Real in, in Texas or in Arizona <coughs> or in California, there was one in Georgia, right? And uh, and the, the the rebellion of the, the natives spread along that route, right? So so once again, not um, it, it, all, all this unrest shows that the Spanish were not controlling uh, with an iron fist. They were not ruling an iron fist. They weren't able to. Logistically, it was not possible. Okay, moving forward. Aha, the Guale Uprising. Now, um, if you are interested in getting PowerPoint of this uh, presentation, I'm gonna pass around a, a sign-up sheet if you want, and you can leave your name and email, and I can keep you informed of all our events. Or you can simply email me right now on your phone, ForgottenLivesLA, gmail.com. So uh, when you do email, just please write a copy of the Black Legends PowerPoint in the subject line, and then I'll, I'll send you the, the PowerPoint. So yeah, you can shoot an email on your phone if you're interested, or sign up, and we'll move forward here to the next legend. The next legend is that of extensive control of the land, right? So uh, once again, we see how in spite of uh, the totalitarian stereotypes or ideas, uh, Spain was not completely in control 
Uh, partial control came from limited technologies for map making, and it came in part from the vastness of the territory. It simply cost too much money to go out in the wilderness and chart every area. The big lesson is, usually in history books, they show the Spanish Empire, and it's usually shaded red or shaded orange, and includes most of the Americas and, and the Philippines and all these uh, other places. There's, there's some other smaller uh, colonies in Africa. Uh, but claiming the land and actually administering it, actually controlling it, were two very different things. One example of an unmapped area is the Orinoco River in what is now Venezuela. The Spanish were not able to begin mapping this area until about the 1760s, so over 200 years since they first arrived in the Americas. And they sent uh, a group of, of uh, Jesuit priests up the river. And the Jesuits partly mapped the area, but then the Spanish crown began to be jealous of Jesuit land holdings uh, in other parts of South America. In order to prevent the Jesuits from gaining too much influence, Spain seized their lands and ordered them to return to Europe. The expulsion of the Jesuits meant that the mapping of the Orinoco River remained vague until the 19th century after Venezuela's independence from Spain. There's another uh, perhaps more comical example of uh, an uncharted area. And again, it comes closer to home. It was not until uh, 1703 that Father Eusebio Quino, who built the missions in um, Arizona, and was another member of the Jesuit order, was able to determine once and for all that California is not an island. <laughs> yes. For almost 200 years, most of the Spaniards believed that California was a large island. This impression was due to the shape of uh, the Baja California Peninsula. As the uh, explorers and, and the soldiers proceeded uh, up the coast of the peninsula, it seemed that it would go on indefinitely until it wrapped around and came back to where they were standing. However, uh, Padre Quino, and to a lesser extent, Junipero Serra, established that California was part uh, on a more serious note, here's where we get to perhaps, well, in one sense, what is the most uh, grave about um, the black legends, right, is that we have uh, these accusations that, um, that come about through the secular or, or subtra uh, subtraction story view of history, is that they forced all conquered people to become Christians forcing them to convert at sword, at sword point, which I call the legend of forced conversion. By this time, it should be clear that Spanish power was not total. Although good many of them would have wished for everyone to be Christian, at least in a general cultural sense, they lacked the numbers and the technology to impose their religion across the continent uniformly. So on this next slide, we have a whole list of uh, indigenous groups throughout the Americas uh, that used to be part of Spain, whose beliefs were alive and well during the colonial period, and some of these groups uh, continue today. Uh, the Chichimeca groups, right, uh, they would not convert to Christianity, and they, they fought the Spanish outright, which is why they took those other mercenary soldiers there to try to uh, try to uh, force them to allow uh, priests to come in. The Tarahumara and, and Yaqui people, to this day, still practice the peyote hunt, where they go out and look for the peyote cactus and use it for hallucinogenic rituals, right? So this, this non-Christian practice uh, continues among them. There uh, is the case of Francisco de Tenamascle, and I'm leaving these up here so you know a, a person could, could look these up uh, easily. And of course, this will be on, on uh, the website af afterwards because of the, the filming. But a person could look up Francisco de Tenamascle and learn that he came under uh, the Inquisition in the 16th century for blasphemy and for polygamy. He had several wives. Uh, and prior to the Tenamasli case, there had been another case that I'm going to get to in a little bit. 
where they had executed an indigenous lord on similar grounds. Well, Tenomastle went all the way to Salamanca. They took him to Spain. And when he got there, who came to his defense but the famous Dominican friar Bartolome de las Casas. Oh. And Las Casas ordered, or argued, excuse me, he argued, look, Francisco Tenomastle has only been a very recent convert, so he's still understanding what Christianity is. Therefore, we should not apply the death penalty. And this Catholic priest won, right? As a matter of fact, it's not until, uh, in a large part, uh, Las Casas' argumentation that we start to think of uh, human rights in general, right? So human rights grow out of the Catholic Church in these Spanish territories, arguing for the rights of indigenous people, most notably Bar Bartolome de Las Casas, but there were others as well. So uh, he, he refused to convert. He refused to give up his beliefs. But did Spain kill him, or did they force him? No, they didn't. They reasoned with him. Uh, San Juan de Chamula is a place where you can go in the state of Chiapas today, which is the southernmost state of Mexico. And you can go and see a, a chapel which has been excommunicated. Because inside uh, this chapel, inside this, uh, this parish church, they have torn out all of the pews and put pine needles all over the ground. And they have all of these images of saints all around the room, more so than, than you would see in most churches. And they're kneeling in front of these images and they're praying in Mayan languages. They're actually praying to their ancestral deities, right? And you can see this today, 500 years later, where uh, Christianity has still not made inroads into these rural parts of, of Mexico. Uh, there's a, there was another rebellion in the 16th century, a gentleman by the name of Juan Teton, which, which a person can easily look up. Juan Teton, he stood out on a street corner and he said uh, effectively, come to me and I will wash off the baptism that the Spaniards gave you. And he also said things like, do you see what happened to our neighbor, Don Don Carlos? He disappeared because he became a Christian and his punishment was turning into a cow. And, and our other neighbors have turned into goats and sheep, or sheep, excuse me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, he, was, he was grappling with, with why, why are people dying? They were dying from diseases. And then there's all of a sudden this appearance of all these uh, animals. There weren't any Americans, but all these livestock. So this gentleman actually turned it into a, a religious cult, right? He, he, taking Christianity, transforming it, turning it into his own thing, and refusing to believe what the Spanish had asked him to believe. Uh, then we have the Tupac Amaru Rebellion, which was uh, another religious, uh, religiously inspired rebellion in return to ancestral ways, and it was in uh, Bolivia and Peru. Uh, Tupac Amaru claimed to be a descendant of the Inca king, and he um, assembled an army around him, and they were successful in, uh, in warding off the, the Spanish for um, over, over a year find, before the, the Spaniards did find him and, and, and kill him in battle. So uh, another example, of course, of the, the, the people refusing to convert. The Mapuche, as we've mentioned before, uh, they, they weren't under political control, and they also did not embrace Catholicism. And, and to this day, they, they place a, a great, great importance on their uh, native beliefs. Uh, do, do, do. And here's, one, here's another one, uh, the Taki Onkoi Rebellion, which was in Peru, and it used Christian images, but they were trying to subvert Christianity by using their traditional dances and continuing to pray to the solar uh, deity Inti Raimi. Here's the earlier Inquisition case, which I had mentioned, and it shows uh, this uh, reality that Spain was not imposing the religion, uh, successfully at least. Uh, Don Carlos Ometochtin uh, blasphemed in public. He, he, he took the Lord's name in vain, and he said things against the Virgin in public loudly, and he also had uh, several wives. Well, they said, you're a Christian, you can't do that, and they tried him under the Inquisition. This was in 1537, so a little earlier on, and they relaxed him to the secular arm. The secular arm executed him, because according to medieval law, blasphemy is a capital crime, right? Well, what happened was the Franciscan order heard about this, 
And the bishop who was in charge of the Inquisition at the time had to step down as a consequence. They said, this is, this is too rough. You can't do this to someone who is a recent convert. This case leads to the eventual division into two uh, groups. You could only um, try Spaniards under the Inquisition or people who uh, had been raised Christian or was in, uh, uh, under the Inquisition. And then uh, the indigenous people were exempt from the, from the uh, Inquisition because of this, which also is helpful, right? Because a lot of folks believe that the Inquisition is imposing it all the way. Well, there was a dreadful mistake in the beginning, but after that, they actually made all native people exempt from the Inquisition. Here we are, yeah, and to this day, there are festivals in, in rural places in Mexico. Uh, Chicontepec, which is in Veracruz, uh, these festivals, traditional deities all the way, traditional modes of ritual. Uh, in Guerrero and Chiapas, there, there are many places that, that are like that. So, um, hmm. what also causes surprise, they weren't, they weren't able to uh, impose the, the religion. Um, in cases where there were abuses, the Spaniards actually corrected themselves after uh, executing uh, indigenous people, they actually corrected themselves and made sure it never happened again, right? What causes another surprise is that the Spanish often engaged in collaborative educational ventures with indigenous people. And these collaborations led to the preservation, preservation of indigenous knowledge, which most often meant preserving detailed descriptions of traditional beliefs. Here we have the most famous example of such collaboration in a place called El Colegio de la Santa Cruz de Tlacaloco, which is north of downtown Mexico, uh, Mexico City. Uh, we actually visited this in our tour at the end of June, so we got to see this uh, firsthand. The Franciscans founded this center of advanced study in 1537. So there, there were two things the Franciscans built. They built the church out of uh, volcanic rock, which came from the ruins, which are right next to it, right? And then that orange building is the uh, colegio that they built, and it was university-level education. Um, so it was the first university in the Americas, and the curriculum there mirrored the best universities of Renaissance in Europe. So indigenous students there, young men, all of them, uh, received the same trivium of grammar, logic, and rhetoric that students studied in Salamanca, Paris, and Bologna. The only difference, the big difference with this college, was that instructors also worked with the native languages, most notably Nahuatl which was the language of the, the Aztecs and the lingua franca of central Mexico. People spoke Nahuatl in Mexico during the entire colonial period. The Spaniards did not force them to speak Spanish because there were too many uh, indigenous people to have that be uh, feasible. Instead, they had interpreters who would help them. And these interpreters were indigenous people who were translating in courts, translating for the government, translating in uh, commercial settings. Uh, so it wasn't until after Mexican independence when the public, when the, um, the idea of public education comes along, and that's when they go to the countryside and say, "We're opening a little school here to teach you Spanish so that you can be modern." And this this whole progress narrative comes in. Uh, now, one of the scholarly projects, there are two really important ones that emerge from there. The first is the Codex Varianus which preserves herbal remedies of ancient origin in Mexico. This they published in 1552, and they published it in Latin with a lot of uh, explanations in Nahuatl and many drawings. They assembled a team of 19 um, native healers uh, and asked them, what are the remedies um, when people get sick? And of course, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of a big, big deal even in, in Mexican folk medicine today. All the herbs in Mexico and all the, the amazing things that they do. And in 1552, the, the Spaniards were just amazed because uh, people in Mexico are, are curing problems that, that um, European medicine was not able to tackle with their with, with mostly their, their bloodletting and other sorts of 
<laughs> things like that with humoralism. But um, through, through extensive experimentation over generations, the indigenous people had figured out the properties of these plants and, and, and which ones could, uh, could heal. And uh, so they preserved that indigenous knowledge. The Spanish, the Spanish priests were not knocking down the culture. They were actually preserving it. And probably the biggest example of, of this comes in the Florentine Codex, which compared to that one small volume is a large 12 volume encyclopedic set uh, that they wrote uh, with two columns. The first column is in Nahuatl, and the second column is a, is a Spanish uh, translation, a loose Spanish translation. Uh, and this 12 volume set called the Florentine Codex was a result of over 30 years of labor on the part of a priest named Bernardino de Sahagún. Sahagún interviewed elders who had been alive before the Spanish conquest and worked closely with a team of indigenous scribes in order to produce what is the largest single compilation of knowledge about the indigenous world in Mesoamerica prior to the conquest. In the case of both the codex by uh, um, Badiano and the Florentine Codex, we are faced with Spaniards who are going to great lengths to preserve indigenous knowledge. And here's something that's ironic. Every anthropologist, every historian, and every literary scholar who wishes to approach the Aztecs must pass through the Florentine Codex, right? Must pass through this document that a priest made in order to better understand the culture that he was trying to evangelize, right? Uh, I could go on about the Cueca de la Santa Cruz all, all day long, and, and Dr. Dr. Taylor, you know, Derek, vouched, vouched for that since uh, we, we were there this last summer. <laughs> but uh, we, we stayed at Tapeo for quite a while, and, and what looks kind of like a, uh, uh, well, uh, it's, it's a church, and, and now these are government offices. It's, it's, it's uh, archives of, um, of the Ministry of the Exterior, right? So we can't actually go into the rooms. But we can go into the courtyard, and we spent time there in the courtyard, imagining these um, students uh, learning there at the Colegio de la Santa Cruz, and actually hearing excerpts from a letter, or, or from, from letters, excuse me, from multiple letters, that one of the um, graduates from the Colegio de la Santa Cruz wrote. This graduate, by the name of Antonio Valeriano, actually went on to become the governor of Mexico City for over 20 years and uh, wrote letters uh, frequently to Philip II. So uh, we see a, a very active community with um, the graduates from this school. We don't see oppression. We see uh, cooperation for a larger project that's emerging. And that project is something new. It's a Christian civilization or a Christian um, uh, polity or city, right, that happens to be indigenous as well, right? Okay, so um, facing the, the history, the real history, just seeing what happens uh, helps us to really look beyond those stereotypes, like I said. Now, uh, at this point, we probably should ask, how did all these legends get started? Why, why do we have this way? Because when you actually look at the history, or if you're on the ground in Mexico, and, and often if, oftentimes if, if, if you talk uh, with people, you'll get a, a little different um, spin than we normally get in that secularizing view, although there are a lot of folks who use atheism as a means of social advancement uh, to try to get ahead and say, I don't believe you're looking at church teaching, but uh, they, you know, they're trying to get ahead. So it's there too in Mexico as well nowadays. However, uh, <coughs> coming back more to uh, this whole idea of the Anglo-centric narrative, we're going to take uh, a little uh, closer look at that um, part of the talk. Uh, so, beginning in the 1500s, as we've seen, the earliest human rights workers were Catholic priests, and they actively began to denounce the incidences of violence and hypocrisy that they witnessed from Spanish soldiers. One famous Dominican, who I've mentioned before, Bartolomé de las Casas, wrote a book called The Brief History of the Destruction of the Indies, La Brevísima Historia de la Destrucción de las, de las Indias. And in this book, he compiled the letters of other Dominican priests to describe um, Spanish abuses. He used the book in order to influence legislation, and he was successful 
there was a trial in the city called um, Valladolid, and from that trial, where he read the whole book out loud as evidence, out of that, in 1555, there emerged a whole body of, of, of laws called the New Laws, Las Nuevas Leyes, made specifically to protect the indigenous people. So Las Casas is, is complex and at times controversial, and she changes some of the viewpoints over, over time, as I'm mm -hmm. sure maybe, uh, some, maybe, maybe um, someone might tell you, or maybe some of us heard here. There's not much time to go in de into depth uh, with him. But one consequence of Las Casas' advocacy was that immediately, his book was translated into several languages, right? So into English, French, Latin, Dutch. And in the Dutch translation, they added a lot of images of Spaniards performing the cruel acts that Las Casas described. Las Casas describes the cruelty, such as um, tying everyone's neck to a pole and marching them for, you know, all day with no food, right? Or making pearl divers go down and stay um, underwater for 10 minutes at a time until they finally just can't take anymore and they have cardiac arrest, right? Those sorts of things he describes are like, Terrible, terrible things, beating women, children, things like that. He describes it, right? That the that, that priests had seen firsthand. Uh, the Dutch depicted those, and then they came into the hands of other uh, Europeans, right? And notably, the British, who were starting to gain more power on the seas. After the defeat of the Spanish Armada, and um, uh, Dr. Taylor, could you help me with that date? Spanish Pardon? Armada? 1588. 1588, thank you. See, we tag team. So after the defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588, that is the beginning of the slow descent for Spain in, uh, out of power. They were, they, were, they were no longer going to be number one. And then we have the, the French who come up and, and have their time of power. And then the British, who all the while are, are quietly building power, and it comes to, for, to, to, the, to its fullest expression in the British Empire of the 19th century and, and even the early 20th century. So this. The English uh, translation uh, included copies of these woodcuts. So they said, look, the Spaniards, innately violent. Look how they treat the indigenous people. That's the beginning of the black legend. Uh, so as Spanish in influence grew less and English influence grew more in history, these images gained the association that is more familiar to us today. The black legend, then, is the belief that the Spanish are more violent than other European nations. There's a preference for France and a preference for England, which has to do with many factors as well, including the rise of Protestantism, right? So uh, it, it became very important for England, while they're building up their empire, to be able to teach her sailors and soldiers the notion that Spain is not as modern as England. Spain's kind of stuck in violent, ignorant and superstitious past. So what began, excuse me, what began as uh, several priests' efforts to defend indigenous human rights provided images of Spanish violence for the English. And the ideas that the English generated, commonly referred to as the black legend, gained more traction in the English-speaking world during the 19th century when the United States entered into armed conflicts with Spanish-speaking nations. However, a quasi-historical work, which is really more literary than historical, also helped pave the way. In 1843 was the publication of William Prescott's The Conquest of Mexico, which, like no other book, has had a lasting effect on English speakers' vision of the Spanish past in the Americas. So I'll pass it around so you can take a look at it. What he essentially did was summarize the work of two Spanish historians, Bernal Diaz de Castillo and Lopez de Gomora, and uh, made it available in uh, an English volume. So uh, at, at a time in the 19th century when um, not many people were studying Spanish, it became a go-to source for the English-speaking world. So I can describe its tendency briefly without reading long passages. Uh, the, the problem is that it recalls details from battle scenes that did not appear in the original chronicles of the Spanish. These sights and sounds include the screams of indigenous people, 
the uh, clatter of horse hooves and the multiple explosions of firearms, all the sounds that are impossible to perceive in the chronicles that the Spaniards left, Prescott's battle scenes are literary and almost cinematic in their intensity. You hear about how ruthless they are, and then he describes Cortez as, as a very ruthless man, and he keeps using those kinds of words, building up Cortez into a larger-than-life figure, right? Did Cortez do abuses? Yes, absolutely. His own chronicles uh, and, and uh, the chronicles of Bernal Diaz de Castillo contain plenty of evidence for that. However, was he this kind of superhuman uh, force of nature? And, and no, not, not remotely. But that we can trace to Prescott's volume. So uh, Prescott's book came out in the midst of tensions in Texas and close to the time of the Battle of the Alamo. So bad blood between the US and Mexico culminated in the US invasion of Mexico City during the Mexican-American War. So we have thousands of soldiers, many of whom had read or heard of William Prescott's book, men whose perceptions of Mexico were set before they even marched on the capital. So before they even got there, they had heard about how violent and backward Spanish speaking people were. Right? They were wearing the lenses that make Mexico and Spanish speakers look less advanced. Similarly, along the same uh, lines here, at the end of the 19th century uh, came the U.S. confrontation with Spain, uh, the Spanish-American War, in order to decide who would control Spanish territories in the Western Hemisphere. The end result, after three months of fighting, was that Spain lost its last colonies. Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines all came under U.S. control. U.S. government paid Spain a sum of 20 million for these lands, and the Spanish Empire became so, no, a memory of Spanish American War. So, American War again, during this military campaign, the U.S. relied on propagandizing the troops and also the general public. It was much easier to see Spanish speakers not as a part of a common Western heritage, but as a more backward, violent, and superstitious splinter group. Many newspapers engaged in techniques of exaggeration, which have come to be known as yellow press. Here, we see a sample from the New York World, published on March 29th of 1898. Notice the Spanish soldier is depicted with a bloody sword, um, subduing a young maiden as a representation of Spain's territorial possessions in, in uh, the world. Spain has violated virgin nature. The names of the conquerors hang in the air around the merciless soldier who has a twisted face. The caption reads, Spain's sense of justice. Imagine the impact on the, uh, of this image and images like it when they were published in the nation's leading newspapers, the nation's largest city, New York. So in closing, we return to the large idea of total power, namely the, the representation that uh, Spain controlled everything that was uncontested. Closer inspection has showed us that this view comes from an Anglo-centric perspective of history. English speakers, because of, their ri because of the rise of, uh, of the language, have tended to see the Spanish Empire as a vestige of the violent and ignorant past. However, another conclusion emerges from this examination. The idea of total control in the Americas reflects a possibility that the Spaniards did not have. In fact, the technology to attempt to control every aspect of people's lives did not exist until the late 19th century and into the 20th century. It is Kaiser Wilhelm, Mussolini, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Chairman Mao, Chiang Kai-shek, and other totalitarian dictators of the 20th century who attempted to control every aspect of people's lives and control people's thoughts. And it's worth adding that many of these figures I just mentioned were atheists, public atheists promoting atheism. Thus, when we look at the colonial past and hear the, the word empire, there's a risk of transferring our own cultural trauma from the 20th century onto the past. In truth, Spain's empire 
was more medieval than modern, although the empire is one of the largest roots on the tree of modernity itself. So we can't understand what, what modern is without understanding the changes that Spain went through. So um, again, if, if you like what you've seen, uh, go ahead and send me an email, or you can um, subscribe on the website, Forgotten Lives of Latin America. That way, you won't miss out on important information on upcoming trips to Latin America, as well as speaking engagements and books available on topics related to colonial Latin America and Latin American studies in general. Go to ForgottenLives.com and sign up today. So now, I would like to extend a, a special invitation um, to our trip to St. Augustine, which will be from January 8th to 12th. 8th to 12th, exactly. 